Hello, you guys. This is Dr. Jim Ruby coming to you from live from my son's bedroom because <laughs> it's one of the quieter rooms in the house right now. But um, I wanted to provide for you some information related to cognitive behavior therapy, cognitive therapy, rational emotive behavior therapy, or REBT as we call it, um, <clears throat> particularly because we didn't have a chance to be together uh, last week. So this will be some information that you can review on your own time and uh, hopefully find some value uh, in it and uh, we'll go from there. So in a nutshell, cognitive therapies, the theories that are related to rational emotive behavior therapy, cognitive therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, believe that our ways of thinking and our ways of behaving and of the feelings that we experience are all quite closely interacted. They, they interact with one another. They're very closely related. So if we can impact, in particular, our ways of thinking, then our behaviors and our feelings will be influenced. Uh, there will be consequences, hopefully positive ones, based on the ways that we adjust our, our ways of thinking or, or um, uh, interacting. So <clears throat> an example of that is Albert Ellis's Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, REBT. And Albert Ellis believed that we have the capacity to be very rational people or very irrational people. And if we had a choice, doesn't it make more sense to be rational? Um, he also believed that no one really can make us happy or unhappy. We do that. And we do that by our way of thinking. So an example. A. A is an activating event. Something happens. So for the purposes of our example, for the purposes of this uh, uh, little lecture, mini lecture, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say I lose my job. That's A. That's an activating event. Ellis suggests that we believe that A leads to C. And C is consequences. And so the C might be, oh, I'm just depressed. Uh, I'm feeling hopeless. Um feeling like there's that I can't really expect much out of life anymore because I've lost my job and it was um, you know, the job I really loved or whatever. Ellis would stop us and say, you're not quite right. A doesn't lead to C. A leads to B, which then leads to C. So what is B? Well, B is beliefs. That I hold beliefs about what happened. And based on my beliefs... I have a sense of what goes on in C. So I lose my job. That's the activating event, right? Well, let's say I hold beliefs such as, well, it was the perfect job. I'll never find another job like that. It's the best job ever. Um, and if I can't find the perfect job, I probably won't find any job that's worth its salt. So I'm probably going to lose my house and uh, my family will leave me. It's just horrible. And if I lost that job, and it was the perfect job, that means I'm a loser. Well, if that's what I'm holding, if those are the beliefs that I'm holding, well, think about what the consequences are going to be. My feeling state is going to be very negative. I'm going to experience a lot of distress. Uh, and it's going to feel worse than if I believed something else. So there's the A, B, C, right? So Ellis suggested that we need to introduce a D, A, B, C, D, and the D is dispute or debate. So who am I disputing? Who am I debating with? Well, I'm debating myself, those beliefs that I'm holding. I'm going to dispute those. Say, wait a minute. Okay. Yes, it totally stinks to lose your job, especially a job you love. And it might be difficult to find a job that I like, but just because I lost this job doesn't mean I'm a loser, doesn't mean that I'll never find another good job. Um, I can. It's going to be uncomfortable. It might even be really tight financially for a while, but it doesn't mean I'm a loser and that my, my future is hopeless. So if I debate, if I debate those you know, beliefs, I dispute those beliefs, and I come up with new beliefs, then guess what's being influenced? The C, the consequences. So I'm not as depressed. I'm not as anxious. Certainly, I'm, there's room for grief and room for being worried about losing your job, something like that. But there's also room for me feeling hopeful 
uh, about what could be next. So that's the ABC model that uh, Ellis introduces. Uh, in the supplemental PowerPoint in Titanium, you'll find some information that I put in there uh, about Ellis and and his model. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it I think it'll be helpful to you. Um, <clears throat> he identified eleven irrational beliefs, and you'll notice as you read through those. I have to be loved by everyone or I'm not lovable. I must do everything well or I'm incompetent. That they reflect a lot of all or nothing thinking, right? I have to forever be controlled by things that controlled me in the past, right? So that's a choice, uh, according to Ellis. And so I could really challenge that, um, that belief. Um, but number but number 11, I think, is, is interesting to me. When you're looking at that list of 11 irrational beliefs in the supplemental PowerPoint, number 11 is I must damn life if I can't find the perfect answers to human problems. So life has to be horrible if I don't find the perfect answer. So life has to be horrible if I don't find the, the perfect partner or the perfect job. Now, if we look at these irrational beliefs, we would say, gosh, none of these relate to me. I don't ever do that. What's up, what's up with that? Well, the truth of the matter is we act like we do, right? So if you look at number one, I must be loved by everyone or I'm unlovable. Um, then uh, we look at that rationally and we say we don't believe that. However, um, sometimes we get really upset if we're not getting along with one person, but we get along with a lot of other people. What's up with that? Uh, yeah. So we act like we believe them, even if we don't. There's a link in that PowerPoint that allows you to see Albert Ellis working with Gloria. So remember Gloria, she worked with Carl Rogers. She also worked with uh, Fritz Perls. She also worked with Albert Ellis. And after the end of all these sessions, Gloria had an opportunity to select one of these theorists that she could continue to have some sessions with at no cost to her. And lo and behold, who did she choose? She chose Albert Ellis. Um, uh, Carl Rogers actually spoke at her funeral many years later. They remained very close friends. But Albert Ellis was the, the individual that she chose to work with therapeutically. Uh, I don't think she ever had anything to do with Fritz Perls <laughs> after that. But um, anyway, so you may want to watch some of this to see how his work is. You'll, you'll notice that he does a lot of teaching. He does a lot of um, discussing things. It's, it, there's, a, there's a real intellectual, uh, rational sort of uh, movement about him. And, and he will debate his, his clients in relationship to their ways of thinking. Um, Aaron Beck, who is kind of the father of cognitive therapy, he was not like Ellis, even though they hold many of the same sorts of assumptions that thinking influences feeling and behavior. Um, Aaron Beck was more Socratic in his approach, meaning that he asked open-ended questions that allowed his clients to draw some conclusions on their own, make some, uh, make some discoveries, uh, and uh, gain some insights about how their ways of thinking may not be serving them. We're going to talk a little bit more about Beck's work here in a minute. But in the last slide of the, the Albert Ellis PowerPoint, there's a song. Uh, so uh, you should sing this song. You definitely should. Um, it's sung to the tune of Yankee Doodle. And if you don't know Yankee Doodle, so I'll sing the first couple of lines for you. It says, love me, love me, only me, or I'll die without you. Make your love a guarantee so I can never doubt you. Love me, love me totally. Really, really try, dear. But if you must rely on me, I'll hate you till I die, dear. Right. So Ellis writes this irrational song to illustrate how we're, we engage in this kind of all or nothing. you got to be the perfect partner or I'm going to throw you to the curb. Uh, you're, great or you're, awesome. you're great or you're awful, but there's not a lot of middle ground. And we know that's not true. There's a lot of middle ground in relationships and in life. Um, Aaron Beck, a cognitive therapist, one of the things that he talked about, as opposed to those irrational beliefs, he talked about cognitive distortions or, or ways that we think that aren't really helpful. Um, so I'm going to talk about those. There's a slide in relationship to Aaron Beck's cognitive distortions in your primary PowerPoint, in the, in the PowerPoint that goes with the textbook, right? So uh, the first is arbitrary inference. 
so arbitrary means, you know, kind of random. Uh, and inferences means I'm drawing conclusions about things. So an arbitrary inference is I'm drawing conclusions about myself or about the world without a lot of evidence to make that information, to draw those conclusions, make that decision. So for an example, uh, let's say, use my example earlier, I've lost my job. Okay, I lost my job and then I'm going to go and apply for another job, but I don't get that job. So I begin to perceive myself as totally worthless and believes that I'm probably never going to be able to find employment of any sort in the future. That's kind of arbitrary, right? Because I've been employed for many years. I've been successfully employed for many years. And maybe because of budget cuts or something, I lost my job and then I try another job. And maybe the economy is not great, so I don't get that job. But now all of a sudden I'm inferring, I'm drawing this arbitrary inference, uh, drawing this conclusion that I'll never find a job. Another one is selective abstraction. I like to think about selective abstraction as being like a uh, like a colander. You know what a colander is? It's like that that uh, kind of a bowl with holes in it, and you put the pasta in there, and all the water runs out. So imagine I'm wearing a colander on my head, right? So I'm filtering. I'm filtering thoughts, and in particular, what I tend to filter if we're doing selective abstraction is I'm filtering out the positive thoughts. And I'm only allowing the negative ones in. So when we see Jerry and Stan working together, we will look at this together in class. Uh, we'll see Stan engaging in some selective abstraction. So we dwell on the negative elements, not the positive elements. So we tend to do that because it reinforces maybe our feelings of depression or anxiety and that sort of thing. Uh, and so we, we get to, we kind of create this self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways. So for instance, you get, uh, you make a presentation in class and um, your instructor says, wonderful job. You have classmates who are saying, you did great. Uh, and you have one classmate who says, yeah, nice job. I did have a question though. You talked about the budget and you didn't give us a lot of detail. Next time, I'd love to hear more about the budget or whatever you know, the element might be about your presentation. And then you go home and guess what you think about? The budget comment. That's all you think about. You forget about all this other positive stuff you heard, right? That's selective abstraction. Uh, you're filtering out the good stuff, and focusing on the bad stuff. Uh, another cognitive distortion from Beck is overgeneralization. So this is where I maybe hold some sort of extreme belief based on a single incident or just a couple of incidents. And um, then I apply it to different or dissimilar uh, situations inappropriately. So uh, maybe you have a woman who's had a negative relationship with her male boss, okay? And then she begins to believe that she's a failure in all other types of relationships with men, right? She overgeneralizes based on that one experience. <clears throat> Another cognitive distortion is magnification and minimization. So making too much out of something or making too little out of something. So magnification is I exaggerate the importance of maybe my own errors or my own fears or my own imperfections. So I can't believe I said that to her. Oh, my life is over, right? I'm magnifying it. Making a mountain out of a molehill. You may have heard that phrase. Minimization is when I downplay, usually in particular, my good points or other people's desirable qualities. So um, so somebody says, hey, nice job. So uh, yeah, it's all right, it wasn't that great. Uh, or you look really nice today. Uh, thanks, this old thing, you know, whatever. It's not like I'm playing coy because I want to hear more. I'm actually literally minimizing the value. Uh, I'm looking at the negative more than the positive. Personalization is when I take something personally that's not meant to be that way. So I interpret events or, or consequences of events as something that means something about me. So uh, maybe somebody's got a brusque tone when they come in and say, hey, what's going on? And, and I go, oh, gosh, they're, they're really upset with me. But there could be any number of reasons why they're feeling that way, right? So maybe a student in class raises their hand and they don't get called on by me. Uh, and they begin to think that I don't like them or I'm biased against them in some way. Uh, so they're personalizing what happened. Labeling and mislabeling 
is another cognitive distortion from Beck, labeling and mislabeling. So labeling is kind of an extreme form of overgeneralization. It involves attaching some sort of negative uh, label to myself or others instead of a mistake. So um, if I'm describing a mistake, I end up describing myself. So I might say, I'm a failure rather than I failed or I'm I am bad instead of I did something bad. Um, interestingly enough, labeling is uh, oftentimes a function of shame. Uh, and shame is different than guilt, right? Guilt is I did something wrong and I feel bad about it. That's actually a functional thing for us to have. Shame is I did something wrong and I'm bad. I am unworthy. I have, um, as a person, I've lost a certain amount of worthiness. So I'm somehow devalued. Uh, that's more powerful and it's, and it's more destructive. And that's labeling. I'm now labeling myself as unworthy or something. Mislabeling is when I describe an event using words that are usually pretty colorful or, or emotionally charged. Uh, so uh, maybe I've eaten too much. I'm binge eating, right? And then I feel bad about myself. When I feel bad about myself, that's guess what I'm probably going to do. I'm going to go binge eat, right? I'm going to eat more. So I eat too much dessert. I feel like a disgusting pig. And if I feel like a disgusting pig, I might as well act like one and eat some more, right? So I get in this cycle uh, from this, uh, this mislabel because I'm not a pig. Then the last one is polarized thinking, right? We might call this all or nothing thinking. And polarized thinking was is very... It's kind of thematic of what Ellis did with all his, of his irrational beliefs. For Beck, that's just one more category, one category of, of different cognitive distortions. So I got laid off. I'm a total loser, right? Um, so my tendency to think of in terms of false dichotomies, false dichotomies is there's this, it's either this or that. It's either good or bad. It's either all or nothing. And in reality, there's a lot of gray area in between. Your relationship is not all good. And just because it's not all good doesn't mean that it's all bad. So there's a gray area in between. So we're either on top of the world or we're at the bottom of it. And that's just illogical, um, quite frankly, unrealistic sorts of ways of thinking. Not everything can be all or nothing of anything. Um, so those are the cognitive distortions, according to Beck. Uh, I hope this is helpful content to you and that you can, um, I don't know, uh, be valuable to you. We'll have a chance to talk about some of these things in class. If you have questions that came up, please let me know, uh, and we'll go from there, but I'll see you in class. Thanks a lot uh, for your time and, um, yeah, hope you're doing well.